Good afternoon. This is a, um, I'm Peggy Rich and I'm the president of the Historical Society Board and we are just delighted to see so many of you here today. Um, if you are a member, we appreciate it. We thank you for your support. If you're not a member, in your seat is a newsletter and it will tell you about what's happening the next month here and there's also a form where you can become a member and we would appreciate your support if you could do that. Um, today I am pleased to introduce Dr. Lindsay R. Boring, our speaker this afternoon. He is a graduate of the University of Tennessee with graduate degrees from the University of Georgia and is the founding director of the Joseph W. Jones Ecological Research Center at HOA. The Jones Center was established in 1991 on the Twig Plantation, a 29,000 acre quail hunting reserve assembled in the 1920s from small farms in Baker County by Robert W. Woodruff, longtime chairman of the Coca-Cola Company. The Jones Center was named in honor of Joseph W. Jones, Woodruff's longtime associate and chairman emeritus of the Woodruff Foundation. Dr. Boring directs 100 employees involved in conservation, <coughs> research and educational programs, and stewardship of the Itchway site. More than 25 graduate students from regional universities have completed thesis research with advisors from the Jones Center. In addition, Dr. Boring currently serves on the graduate faculty of both the University of Georgia and the University of Florida. We are delighted to have all of you here with us today. And Dr. Boring, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And I appreciate that thoughtful introduction because most of these people have never seen me attired like this. <laughs> But it's, just, it's a really diverse and wonderful group here. And uh, I was asked to give a little bit of a context as well as an, as an introduction today for our three co-authors of, of the book, The Art of Managing Longleaf. And really the point of departure for the context is as she had stated, Robert Woodruff put the property and, and it's the Woodruff Foundation that supports the Jones Ecological Research Center programs. But the context is that Herbert Stoddard put this property together with Richard Tiff for Robert Woodruff between 1929 and 1941. And so when, with the passing of Mr. Woodruff and the uh, determination that Itchaway would be committed to conservation, uh, we have assembled research and education programs and partnerships with many of the organizations here in this room uh, and I'm glad to see some Florida Gators in the group here, as, as well as the Bulldogs, I, I would add. Uh, our, our mission uh, is conservation. Research, traditional education programs, and outreach are really the tools that we use. Uh, our, our working arena has been largely with Longleaf Pine ecosystems, uh, studying the ecology, the biology, and, and the forestry of Longleaf Pine. Uh, we also are very involved in wildlife and watershed level studies and being in the lower Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint Basin, there is an endless need for scientific information on water resources and that's been a, been a fortuitous that that includes our mission. Um, but the context of Herbert Stoddard, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a legacy that we all share uh, here, in, not just in southwest Georgia, but it's a legacy that managers of pine land across the eastern United States can, can share in. And there's a very important story that this book tells. And it's not just a story of a few counties in southwest Georgia. It, it's a story of history and it's a context, a much broader context, of conservation of pinelands and wildlife in the United States. And as we know, that legacy goes even far beyond. And, I, and in my opinion also, uh, much of that legacy left in the, the, the conservation and the art and practice of management of longleaf pine, of course, includes the roots of fire ecology uh, and of what we would call ecological forestry as well. These are lessons that hopefully are going to be uh, told more broadly. Uh, many of the programs that uh, we're working with are, are hopefully going to increase 
the use of the Stoddard Deal approach to forest management, not just on several tens of thousands of acres in southwest Georgia, but on Department of Defense lands. And I think even <coughs> as we speak this year and next year, the implementation of the Stoddard Neal system on many of the Department of Defense installations uh, has already been undertaken. Fort Benning was really the first place the Stoddard Deal system uh, was implemented, and that came about through a partnership between Leon, uh, our forestry staff, and uh, the, the installation staff at Fort Benning. And out of that nugget of initial forestry uh, much of it was demonstration and education work, but it evolved much more into putting the scientific and the economic metrics together. So it's been important that we also, as we, as we move into the research realm, beyond the art of the management, it's been very important to build metrics of the economics and, and the ecology of, of the system as well. And without Leon's many, many contributions in this realm, that simply would not have happened. And one thing I'd like to do at this point is I'm going to uh, introduce Leon, uh, Paul Sutter, and Bert Way. And uh, it's not without a little temerity that I have to be so presumptuous as to introduce Lee and Neil to this group. <laughs> Many of you have known him probably about 50 years longer than I have, and I've had a long-term working relationship. <laughs> but I, I think it, it's good to maybe even let us revel a little bit in, in, in his achievements. Uh, he was an alumnus in 1950 of the UGA Forestry Program. It's now called the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. And I think it's also very noteworthy uh, to those of you that haven't heard this. Lee and Neal was a 2009 recipient of the Distinguished Alumnus Award in Forestry for the Warnell School. And I think we need to recognize that. And that's been a very long overdue recognition. And uh, as a former faculty member of that institution and an adjunct faculty member, I, I think the school is all the more wealthy for that experience. Um, the relationship with the Jones Center uh, is actually pretty young in Leon's context of his whole career. For the last 15 years, he's served as either an informal or a formal uh, consultant and advisor to the Jones Center. From 1997 until 2009, we actually appointed him to our formal uh, scientific advisory committee, feeling the need to put a, a practitioner and, and a steward of Longleaf Pine directly in the middle of all of these, these uh, uh, highfalutin scientists off the National Academy of Science. And Leon has given us a strong grounding in land management and uh, regional conservation, which, which we've benefited from enormously as our program has grown. So the art and the practice of Longleaf Pine, I think, it's, I think it's so important to understand uh, if those of us that are scientists uh, that have to live in, in the world of scientific publication, that the science is not the beginning and the end of what we should be doing. Uh, the art and the practice is what's too often lost in the hallowed halls of academia. And that's what's been so well demonstrated here in the Piney Woods of Southwest Georgia. Uh, Herbert Stoddard was not a, a scholarly entity like Aldo Leopold in that era of conservation, but Herbert Stoddard left his fingerprint on huge acreages of land that he played a critical role in conservation. Not only that, but primarily on private lands. The book we're here to celebrate today really tells a story of why that has been and how that's happened. And I think that uh, there's a very, very important wildlife story there. And in terms of how wildlife and forestry have been, been integrated, and in fact, I think Leah Neal probably took the very first wildlife management course about 1948 first time it was ever taught in the, in the School of Forestry at UGA. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce two of the other speakers, and, and then we're going to have Leon share a few words with us. Dr. Paul Sutter, on my right here, is Associate Professor of History at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He spent about a decade with the University of Georgia, and he was 
and but prior to that time, for three years, he was at University of Virginia, and he was became very interested at that time in Southern environmental history. He, the author of Driven Wild, How the Fight Against Automobiles Launched the Modern Wilderness Movement, was published at the University of Washington Press. He's co-editor of the newly released Environmental History and the American South, a reader, which is published by University of Georgia Press in 2009. He's also published numerous articles and book chapters on the American Wilderness Movement, Southern Environmental History, and other topics. And very importantly, he edits a uh, series of books that are being published by the University of Georgia Press on the environmental history and the American South. And there, there are several of those. And Paul's going to share a few words with us about, about the UGA Press. Uh, being uh, one of their editors, uh, he is also representing UGA Press today. We had hoped we'd have someone from UGA down to say a few words, but quite honestly, I don't think anybody could explain it better than someone who's, who's contributing the books and, and to the editorial process. Uh, I also would like to uh, provide a brief introduction for Dr. Uh, Burt Way. Uh, Burt received his doctorate in history from the University of Georgia in 2008. Uh, he was supported by the Jones Ecological Research Center on our graduate co-sponsorship program. And um, I'm also very proud to uh, share an accolade that his dissertation was awarded the most outstanding dissertation in the Franklin College of Arts and Sciences in 2008, the year that he completed his degree. And uh, you can, when you read the book, you'll, you'll see how his understanding and his contributions were well reflected. And he will have another book in the Environmental History series uh, that will be published probably in about another year and a half. Uh, he currently is a postdoctoral fellow in Southern Studies at the University of South Carolina. Uh, he has published in the journal Southern Cultures and Environmental History, and he'll publish uh, this book, book on Herbert Stoddard and his work in the Red Hills, in his work, in the next couple of years instead of a year and a half, which I just had lived. <laughs> he will also be a visiting scientist at the Jones Ecological Research Center again this summer in uh, 2010. So with that, I, I would like for Bert, uh, have a few words, and then we'll hear from the other two audience. Um, thank you, Lindsay. Um, thanks to the Thomas County Historical Society for having us here and to allow us to celebrate this book. And, and Leon's life and work in the woods, um, this project has been a really special project uh, for, for all of us involved. Um, also, just to thank, we'd like to thank Leon and Julie um, for Welcoming, welcoming us into their home over the last several years. Um, it's been a truly special experience to get to know them um, on a personal level. And I, I think that personally, that's one thing that both of us will take away from this project that um, we will never forget. Um, also, we need to thank the Jones Center. Um, the Scientific Advisory Committee and the scientific staff at the Jones Center uh, recognized long ago that Leon had a very important story to tell um, about his, his life and work in the woods. In particular, thanks to Lindsay and Kevin McIntyre and um, scientists such as Steve Jack and Bob Mitchell and Jimmy Atkinson. Um, all of these folks at the Jones Center recognized um, that Leon's story needs to be out there. Um, and they helped us to really understand um, this, the longleaf pine savanna, savanna ecosystem, ecosystem um, on a level that we probably wouldn't have gained otherwise. And they also helped, to, helped us to understand the importance of Leon's um, philosophy of forestry. Um, and it really is a philosophy, I think. Um, um, it's a method also, but, but it's very much a philosophy. Um, we especially need to thank Kevin McIntyre, um, who really saw us through from beginning to end and stepped in. Kevin is the edu education coordinator at, at the Jones Center. And he stepped in at key moments um, to help us um, through this project, um, you know, bolster our spirits and, and to remind us that it was, it was worth um, um, trucking forward. So thanks to all of those folks at the Jones Center. 
Uh, I just want to say just a few words about how we put this thing together. Um, our role in this project started in the spring of 2004 when the Jones Center contacted Paul about uh, doing um, some sort of project on, on, on Leon's work. And uh, we decided that we should start off with an oral history project. And Paul brought me aboard. I was a graduate student at the time um, in history at UGA. And um, so we got to work that summer uh, of, of 04 when we decided, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll start interviewing Leon. We um, went through sort of a process of getting to know each other. And um, it was a competitive process. And um, we were very fortunate to, um, to get the job. And so we, we started um, interviewing Leon that summer. And over the next year, we um, put together a series, a, long, a series of long interviews. Um, sometimes I would come down. Sometimes we would both come down. Um, and we just sat around and, and talked with Leon about his, um, his life growing up in Thomas County, um, his life, um, his working life with Herbert Stoddard, his, his family life um, with his wife Julie and, and, and kids, uh, Julie and Susan, and, um, and his deep appreciation of nature. And um, it, was, it was a really special um, year, I think, for, for all of us. Um, just to listen um, to Leon reflect on a, on a, on a life in the woods uh, is sort of how I always um, refer to it. Um, after finishing those oral histories, um, we all realized that there was something there that, that more people should see. And we started trying to figure out how, how to get it out there for folks to see. And um, the oral histories, um, after we transcribed them, um, they are, they're in the Forest History Society in Durham, North Carolina, and there's also a, a copy of, at the Jones Center. Um, but we knew that, you know, there, there, there weren't going to be many people um, to, to see those. And so we, we talked with Liam and Julie, and we talked with the Jones Center, and we talked with our friends at UGA Press, and got really enthusiastic support. And, um, and so we, we decided to, to winnow down that, that big transcript. Um, into a narrative, and we soon into a into a book, and we soon found out that that was um, going to be a, a more difficult process than we ever imagined. Um, if if anyone has, um, or you know, we don't we don't speak out a book. We don't we don't just um, say it out loud. And so there was a lot of uh, we had to do a lot of cutting and pasting, um, and filling in, connecting material, and um, just a lot of work to make this into a narrative, and so we, we drafted out <coughs> chapters. Um, we um, we sent them down to Leon. He went over them. We came down um, at least a half a dozen more times, um, and which was a real perk for the whole project and really kept us going. Because being able to come down here, um, it was it was something really nice to look forward to. Um, and so finally, after about five more years of work, um, <laughs> uh, we uh, had a we had a um, a narrative and a and a, a manuscript, and so um, we we're really pleased with how it came out. Um, I, I think that this was a, a really unique experience. Uh, for all of us, and I think it's a very unique book. Um, if some of you have read it, um, I think you can recognize the un uniqueness of it, and I hope that um, you'll all take a look. And it's um, it's just a really unique book in the way that it came together. And Leon worked alongside people <coughs> like Herbert Stoddard and Ed Kamerick and Roy Kamerick. Um, and I think we've come to realize <coughs> This group of Leon and Stoddard and, and the Comerics and, and many others uh, formed one of one of the most important group, groups of conservationists in the Southeast and possibly the nation in the last half of the 20th century. And um, this is Leon's story to tell about that really important group of people who were doing some really important work. Um, and so it's been a, a, real, a, a truly collaborative process. Um, that has been a, a personal and professional highlight um, for me 
and it's one that I will continue to look back on as um, one of one of the most special projects I've ever worked on. Uh, and that's really all I want to say. And I think Paul is going to talk a little bit about um, some, some of the larger questions that we that we're addressing with this book. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you all for coming. I know there's an important hockey game on right now, so we all have that on your DVR. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time talking to Leon over the last few years, and I had no idea he had so many friends. <laughs> Unless they're all Julie's friends. <laughs> well, I, I too want to thank Leon and Julie. This has been um, a really remarkable experience for us. Uh, I will say I've lost about 10 pounds moving away from Georgia, um, <laughs> although I might have gained it back this weekend. Uh, I want to thank the Jones Center as well. Um, they provide a tremendous support to this project, financial, spiritual, um, and, and motivational. Um, I want to thank Bert, too. Bert came on uh, to help me with this project and, and, uh, and was more important to it than, than we could ever have imagined. Uh, he did so much of this work, and, uh, and of course, I want to thank Leon for putting up with us uh, and how difficult this book was. I also want to, uh, as a representative of PGA Press, say just how important this book has been uh, to the press. I also want to thank the press for uh, allowing us to put together the book that we want. Um, this book was uh, a long time in creation. The press thankfully agreed to allow us to put in some expensive color photographs in the middle, which we really felt were critical to illustrating the Stoddard Neal approach. Um, and, and the press has just been wonderful throughout this whole process. And as you'll see, uh, they produce beautiful books. <coughs> Kevin McIntyre uh, got in touch with me almost six years ago, I think. Uh, maybe about six years ago, almost to, to the month, um, and asked me if I might be interested in, in helping them to write a book about um, Herbert Stoddard, Leon Neal, the Stoddard Neal approach. <coughs> I was fairly new to the state of Georgia. Um, I was beginning to look around this state to, to find out what were the most important conservation stories. And I'd written a dissertation in a, a book that had just come out that, among other things, looked a lot at a man named Al Aldo Leopold, who might, have, might well be the most important conservationist of 20th century American history. And always floating around the edge of the Leopold story was the story of this man named Herbert Stoddard, um, a self-taught naturalist who had been uh, born and raised in the Midwest and down in Florida, and had come down to Georgia in the 1920s to, to deal with this quail problem um, that, that plantation owners were beginning to discover and, and, and try to figure out. Um, and so when Kevin asked me if I, if I wanted to be involved in this project, I was of two minds. On the one hand, I had several other book projects that I was trying to get done, and my immediate reaction was saying, no, I'm too busy, I can't do this. Um, on the other hand, though, I, I feel like I'd just been thinking about Herbert Stoddard the week before, and I thought, this is just too good an opportunity to pass up. So I said, okay, if we, can, if we can do two things, if I can just do the oral history part and then reassess, and if I can bring my graduate student, Bert Wave, in on this project with me, I'll do it. Um, and I'm so glad I did. Selfishly, I'll also say, um, I wanted to get to know Leon and Julie, and I, I, I wanted to see these farms, which I never had, had a chance to see before. And then we started doing some research on Stoddard and Neil and their forestry approach, and I think we both began to realize that this was a much more important story than either of us had even quite realized. Um, that we were sitting on a gold mine here, and, and I think we were uh, amazed that no one had gotten to it before we had. So let me say a couple of things about what I see. I'm an environmental historian, that's my training. What I see is the importance of the stoddard Neal approach to the history of American conservation and perhaps also the future of American conservation. I quickly realized that this was not a story about the national parks, about wilderness, 
about leaving nature alone. What was so important about this project was that it was a story of ecological conservation through land management, often made from <coughs> private lands. Uh, and a lot of environmentalists who had come into the doing of environmental history, for them, this kind of management was often anathema to protection. Um, but I soon realized that in this landscape and in this story, it was critical. And it was something that Aldo Leopold, a, a, a student, had taught me, that, that land management was really critical. Herbert Stoddard and then Leon Neal helped us realize a few things about good land management in this region and helped bring about, I think, several important and innovative developments in, in land management and conservation. First and most, probably don't have to tell you all this, um, they helped to show how important fire was in certain ecological systems and maintaining their function and their diversity. Um, Aldo Leopold is generally uh, seen as the most important early wildlife manager. Uh, he wrote uh, the, the textbook on the subject. Um, but as Leopold would have told you, in many ways, Herbert Stoddard was the founding figure of the field and his Bob White Quail, uh, the most important early wildlife management study. And then probably most important to this book, um, over the first couple of decades, of Stoddard's practice, and then when he brought Lee on, in on the practice. This also became a timber management method, a way of um, managing woodlands, not only for game, but also for a sustainable <coughs> yield of, of timber, all the while protecting, and in fact, enhancing um, the ecosystem. This was ecosystem management before its time. It was, a, it was a system that worked with private landowners and, and increasingly public landowners to meet their management needs all the while protecting <coughs> enhancing ecological resources, um, protecting the economic, the recreational, the ecological, and, and I think the other thing that Leon really helped us see, the aesthetic value of these lands. This, it seems to me, is the kind of conservation that we need today. Um, but it's not easy. It demands a tremendous amount of on-the-ground knowledge and of experience. It demands good science, but not good science alone. It also demands practical land management skills of the sort that can only be developed over many, many years of working in and it demands artistry, artistry, not formula. Uh, Leon would always tell us this is an art based in science. And I think that's a really important part of his uh, management legacy. Ultimately, the stoddard Neal approach <coughs> is an approach that demands life <coughs> um, Which is why I think the Jones Center rightly suggested and, and why Bert and I became so convinced that the history and the principles of the Stoddard Neal approach to long leaf uh, wiregrass management needed to be paired with a biographical approach. Leon's story needed to be part of this larger story of conservation management. Um, it's been a long road, but I'm really thrilled to have this book out, and I'm so happy that you all are here today to share this launch with us. And so. I guess that's all I'm going to say today. I want to turn it over to Leon, see if he has a few words to say, and then we'll get on with some socializing. <laughs>
the value of the Jones Center is that they, they've got a, a group of people all the way from the employees on the ground up to the director himself who have a, a real interest in the land and in accomplishing the desires of Mr. Woodruff and the succeeding uh, boards that run the property. Uh, it's just a, everybody's on the same track. And, if, and there's so, with so many people of so much intelligence up there uh, working to do something right, uh, if you get off track a little bit, somebody's going to tell you about it, and you're going to discuss it for a long time, and they'll be experimenting with it. And you're going to get right. Yeah, it's been a joy. Uh, they don't do things just to spur of anyone. But uh, uh, I, I really sort of don't. I stand in awe here. I look at see my friend over there, Dr. Eric Tucker from the University of Florida. Uh, I appreciate him being here. I'm glad he was coincidentally going somewhere to, to have to hear about this and stop dead. I know he didn't come to you. <laughs> all I can say is it's been a real pleasure, and I have learned more than I have contributed. I promise you that by being associated with all of these people, like Eric at the University of Florida and the University of Georgia. And, and, and well, we had a group the other day, Cooper Jones, so from, uh, there were about 40 states represented by people here to, uh, to uh, look at the area, and look at the Jones Center and all that sort of thing. Well, it's been, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, uh, I want to make one thing real clear. If I've accomplished anything, it's because of that lady sitting right over there that you didn't need <laughs>
could you comment please on uh, briefly what you see as the future of the longleaf pine in the south is it coming back uh, in a planting way to, to manage a bigger forest that way this is a uh, that's a very very good uh, question and i spend hours thinking about it uh, dr board and, and paul and Bert might be able to add something but i'll give you my my uh, uh, ideas at the moment uh, the longleaf system is one of the greatest ecological systems in the world as far as I'm personally concerned, and I'm not familiar with all of the world now. But the one problem between man and longleaf, and this is true between man and a lot of other things on Earth, is the maturity time. Uh, it takes, uh, to, follow through on, uh, to follow through an ecological management, Stand of longleaf, and we have one good one left. One good one. And that's the big woods of Greenwood. And y'all can see that by driving the, the, uh, the public road, Old Pine Tree Boulevard, and look on both sides and see the big woods of big wood, yeah, Greenwood. Uh, that stand of temple has got trees in it that range from seedlings that we've caught, we live in the lab with us on now that we caught this year. Uh, they'll probably not last, but we've got seedlings that range from very young, 5, 10, 15, 20 years of age, up to trees that are possibly 500 years of age. Now we have not, uh, that's not a scientific statement, uh, but we have counted, I personally have counted rings on stumps of long that were lightly struck and cut down, and the stumps were cut two feet below, the eight, 18 inches above the ground and got up to 380 rings on that stump. Now, from that 18 inches onto the ground that was out there, uh, it could have been 100 years easy in that growth in that time that we can't count. Now, the scientists can do it with certain instruments and all, I think. Uh, we've got Roy Kamari bought an increment for it, which is how you bore into the, the heart of a tree and pull the core out and count the rings. Well, he wanted to lay one of the big trees, one of the old trees. So he bought this, I think it was a 32-inch increment board, which means you could measure a tree 64 inches in diameter. Now, if you've ever tried to bore a hard pine with a ring running 20, 30, 40 to the inch, uh, at ground level, you can't do it. You've got to have an electricity and a machine where you don't have to bore, you know. But he gave up on that as a person. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we do know by experience that, uh, uh, and we'd like to exaggerate some, but we've probably got some trees out there that go well over 400, but probably all up to around 500. Not many, but a few. Now, to get back to the story, Longleaf is best managed to, to perpetuate it definitely in a multi age class way. You don't go in there and clear cut and plant. You've got one age class that you're working with there, you see. We've got maybe 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 age classes in the Longleaf Forest under the ecological management. And, uh, and so and we, can, we, can take a, we can take a return, but it's I'll be the first to admit that you can't uh, you can't run what is today considered a, a, an economically feasible system by managing long term, and that's the one big problem with long term. We're working on that agreement that it jumps on a little bit trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> but if you see the point I made, yeah. I think we should mention that there's probably been very close to one million acres of young longleaf planted in the last decade. And that has to do with a lot of the technology for artificial regeneration of longleaf seedlings coming a long way. Better quality bare root seedlings as well as containerized seedlings. But uh, if we take the important lesson that Lynn's teaching us, we've got a lot of these plantations that are about 1 to 15 years old. But by my best extrapolation from his aging of trees, it's still going to take about 300 years to grow, grow a 300-year-old tree. <laughs> <laughs> but the key to that, of course, 
if you've got a if you've got a forest like the Dome, a thousand acres at least with this this uh, been managed for along ecological lines for, for the last hundred years, uh, you can't get greedy with it. You've got to you've got to focus on the land in the temple. And, and the return you get has to be very careful, but you, by being careful and not greedy, you can get a reasonable return off of it over time. Now, you can't get an annual return. You might have to sometimes skip 20 years before you get an economic return. But we're getting into the technicalities there, and it's hard to explain. But my point is, it can be done as long as the human animal behaves himself. <laughs> Any other questions yep. people like to ask? Lynn, can you take, this may be comparing apples and oranges, can you take the conservation principles that you use in our longleaf forest and apply them to other areas? For example, could you use the burning in California to avoid some of the wildfires? Well, uh, yeah, but now I'm not going. To, I'm not going to suggest that I can manage the California lands out there. <laughs> but ecologically speaking, and I think I hope Lance agrees with me. Uh, uh, those those lands out there burn at some time in a state of nature, and so if if, if I, I think people are working. In fact, I know people are working on because we have a couple here, but. Uh, they got, a, they got a big uh, problem compared to us. They don't have the moisture to control the fire. But they are working on that. But to answer your question this way, I think any system, any ecosystem that evolved under the presence of fire as some, on some routine, uh, fire is necessary if you're going to be successful in managing it in, in the future, you see. In other words, if fire is part of the natural management system before man, then mm -hmm. if you want to protect the total uh, the total ecosystem and all the critters therein, uh, you will have to inject fire in there. But I don't know what what routine would be. Eric, what about that man? You're the expert man. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, Eric's a real good professor. Typical but good. <laughs>
it is, it's, it's a fully static state. Yeah. Any other questions? Did you ever run across any moonshine stills here? <laughs> <laughs> you, you'd be surprised. I, 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 I haven't lately, but uh, in the first uh, 20 years of working with this title, we found quite a few. <laughs> and, uh, now, some of you, some of you gentlemen, I see a few gray hairs out there. Y'all might go back this far, but one of the biggest things, one of the biggest businesses around, was using plantation land as an exchange between the seller and the buyer. And the way they did that. Uh, you don't see many big, big old five gallon glass jugs anymore, you know. <coughs> the jugs ended up with several of them over the years because I'd find them in the woods all the time. Only <laughs> <laughs> once did I find one with something in it. <laughs> that turned out to be rainwater. So <laughs> Real fun, back in, uh, <laughs> back in three, two generations. Previous to the one that's owned the mill pond now, that generation. Uh, that was the favorite trading place in Thomasville. Uh, it, it, it was so convenient, it was wide open. All of you gentlemen from Thomasville, my age, that's where we used to court out there. <laughs> 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 we used to find jug after jug after jug after that. Out there. But mostly it was the empty one being set out to be filled. <laughs> I hadn't seen the real moonshine, moonshine still in, in, in a while. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Hayes, you mentioned that you were working with the Indians in Indiana. Yeah. Uh, what was the motivation for that? And what did you learn about the Indian conservation ethic and your aesthetic appreciation of nature? What do you think uh, is most important in instilling that in future generations? Uh, You've you got to forgive me. I'm getting a little hard of hearing, and I didn't pick up everything with this. When you look back on your development of your own conservation ethic and your aesthetic appreciation of the pine forest, how do you think we instill that in future generations? Well, um, first of all, uh, you don't have to be born in the woods, I don't think, to have an appreciation of the woods, even though I'm speaking now of only experience in a small town. Uh, if you were born in little New York, I don't know if you have an appreciation of the woods hell or not, but, uh, there is a fact that if you go up and see something function good and have and live in the woods and, and begin to appreciate what they offer and all, then you have a better. <coughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, uh, there's another angle, and I'm, I'm getting way out now, and you know, I hope you haven't got anything to talk and tell me. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not convinced, and I'm not smart, but I'm not convinced that we can live on this earth without vegetation, and uh, a forest is a hell of a lot more vegetation as far as the ecology is concerned than, than the grassland. So anyway, the point is that, uh, that our forests have destroyed more and more and more and more and more and more concrete coming out. Uh, but uh, anyway, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the young people do. Well, so we, I think we're going to be signing some books for a little while. We, um, we need to have some folks from the...